the latest in breast cancer diagnosis and treatment, next on Caucus New Jersey. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Englewood Hospital and Medical Center and by Qualcare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents. Welcome to Caucus, New Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato here in the studio to talk about the latest in breast health is a distinguished panel of experts. Dr. V. Merle McIntosh, Chief of Breast Surgical Services at Englewood Hospital and Medical Center. Deb Belfato has been with us many times. She's the founder of the Susan G. Komen for the Cure in North Jersey and a breast cancer survivor of 23 years. She's been with us many, many times. Tiziana Vitale is a six-year breast cancer survivor. And finally, Dr. Jenny Grana, who is director of the Cooper Cancer Institute in Camden, New Jersey, and a medical oncologist specializing in breast cancer. I want to thank all of you for joining us. Now, Deb, you've been with us many, many times. While you're not a clinician, per se, we've talked about this, and I'm, I'm curious from your perspective. In the last three years, and I asked you this before we got on the air, the last three years, the most significant development that you've seen, not just as a survivor, but an advocate as it relates to breast health, breast health is? Steve, honestly, the options that are available to women and men that are diagnosed with breast cancer today. Targeted therapies, because it's not a one-size-fits-all disease anymore like it was perhaps 25 years ago. Um, so we're very fortunate to benefit from the research, the research dollars. We're seeing progress and we're seeing more and more lives being saved because it can be so much more specific to your type of cancer. Doctor, jump in. Talk to us. What have you seen? Absolutely, I agree with Deb. We see now lots of patients who previously would have had chemotherapy are no longer getting chemotherapy because we are looking at the tumors and saying, well, you know, this tumor has a very low chance of recurring 10 years from now, so this patient does not have to have chemotherapy, whereas even five years ago, based on the patient's age, if it was a young patient, a tumor larger than one centimeter, automatically that patient got chemotherapy. Just five years ago? Just five years ago. And now with uh, the options like the Oncotype DX and the Mammoprint. Oh, ah, you're back here. <laughs> Tell us what that is. The Oncotype DX is, a, they look at 21 aspects of a patient's tumor, the receptors and other aspects, and they are able to come up with a score as to what the chances are that 10 years from now this patient would have a recurrence if they're only treated with a hormone pill, an estrogen blocker like tamoxifen, for example. If it is a low score, that patient does not need chemotherapy. A high score patient will need chemotherapy. So I want to understand something. And by the way, if you're just tuning in, this is part of our Healthy You series. Log on to our website and you'll find important information about breast health. I'm curious about this. Given the, the advances that we're talking about, and doctor, I'll come back to you and your perspective on this as well. Is it fair to say that you were diagnosed six years ago? Mm -hmm. You were diagnosed 23 years ago. Correct. That if you're going to get breast cancer, being diagnosed with it, that being diagnosed today, you have many more options. There's better treatment. You have a better shot. All that, is that, is that a fair assessment? Absolutely. Dr. Grant, talk Worldwide, to us about that. Uh, survival from breast cancer has significantly improved, and that improvement is due to early detection, education. Women are better informed about risk and make more proactive choices better surgical treatment, better drugs, uh, better ability to define cancers. We no longer think of breast cancer as one disease and you treat it all the same. We're now able to subdivide breast cancer into groups with different prognoses and different treatment options for that particular group. And we now have drugs that are targeted to those specific groups. So we are so much better at uh, individualizing the treatment for the individual woman. And it's interesting, six years ago when you were diagnosed, if, if you can go back and think about your reaction, and Deb and I have talked about this in many different forums and the, the different things she, is, she went through and ultimately becoming this champion, this advocate, which is a long process, right? <laughs> For you. Quite a process. I'm not you, the norm with that. What do you mean you're think, not the norm? I don't think I was the norm at that time. Um, Why do you say that? Because I, I did something really drastic. You know, I, I did what, I, I had a family history, so, I was always waiting for the other shoe to drop, and uh, I knew that the minute I had something that was abnormal, you know, 
in my mammograms or something yep. came up. You were, you, were, you were constantly getting tests and you were expecting something. Um, I was just having my regular mammograms and nothing else was coming up, but in the back of my mind, I just felt like maybe I'm, I'm going to be next. My grandmother had it, my mom had it. I mean, my grandmother lived to be 94. My mm -hmm. mom's alive and well. Um, so what it, I, I kind of thought, well, whatever kind it is, it's not going to be that bad. Right. Because <laughs> they're, they're okay, you know. And so when you were diagnosed, you did not get a lumpectomy, which many women get. No. You got a mastectomy. Yeah, I opted for Why? that. Why? Because I didn't, well, first of all, I, I was like 44 years old, and I didn't want to go on tamoxifen. I didn't want radiation. I felt that was more invasive than what I did. And I didn't want to worry about it anymore. I didn't want the stress of knowing that every six months I would have to go and you know, be checked again. And I couldn't live with that stress anymore. And you just made that decision? I made that decision when I, I saw my, you know, I was 23 years old and I saw my grandmother showing my mother her mastectomy scar out of just at, by accident. And I, I said, I'm not going to do this because I saw she just had one. And, and as I learned more about it, I sure. educated myself. Um, I got brave. I went on websites. I looked at before and after pictures, and I saw what plastic surgery was doing. And I said, you know, it's, for me, it was a no-brainer. It made I was happy. I was so happy. Talk I, I think it's, it's it's very interesting. I will say, in the past five years, I've had more women ask for bilateral mastectomies. So explain that. You know. Normally, when a patient is diagnosed with breast cancer, the options are given to them in terms of treatment. You can either have a lumpectomy followed by radiation, or you can have a mastectomy with or without reconstruction. We're finding now that a lot of, the, the pendulum is almost swinging back. In the 80s, most women had mastectomies, and then later on, we saw lumpectomies taking over, so that 75 to 80 percent of women were having lumpectomies. Now we're finding, and especially in the younger women, they're opting for bilateral mastectomies with reconstruction because, as Tiziana said, they don't want to be coming every six months for a mammogram. And every time they call them back for another view, they die a thousand deaths. Mm -hmm. And we will hear people talking about, well, the studies don't show that there is an in increased survival with doing this. But I always remind people that these are human beings, these are not statistics. So even though the statistics may not indicate that you live longer by doing the more drastic surgery, mentally, you probably live better because the worry is, is there something a, a lot. Is issue here? I, it, absolutely, it, it, absolutely. Good. But if I could jump in, sure. I think I'm mm -hmm. somewhat of a poster child <laughs> um, for lumpectomy. Mm -hmm. I mean, in 1988, when it was not the norm by any means, and it wasn't necessarily my choice. My choice was, my, my biggest choice was, mm -hmm. I hoped I would live. Um, so I trusted the team of doctors, and it was told to me that I was undoubtedly a candidate for a lumpectomy, followed by radiation, followed by chemotherapy. And chemotherapy at that point in premenopausal women was kind of unclear. It was, it was more than kind of unclear. It was really uncertain. So, you know, I see a lot of women, like yourself, you know, with that, when I wake up in the morning, I don't want to have to think about this. Mm -hmm. But the pendulum has swung to the extreme mm -hmm. as well. And, you know, I just, I, I wonder sometimes, I wish, I wish in so many things in life that we could find that, that midpoint. But, but it's, it's part of this about reconstruction because the reconstruction, like everything in medicine, re the reconstruction process, I imagine, offers more alternatives. It's more advanced. It's more sophisticated. Now. You can do more now than, now. right, than, oh, say, absolutely. 20, 25 yeah, years ago. Absolutely. Is that part of the equation? And by the way, well, are you seeing some of the same things? Well, Dr. I'm seeing the same things. I think we're all seeing an increase in the interest in bilateral mastectomies. I think the job of the surgeon and the medical oncology and radiation oncology team, as they work with the woman, is to discuss all options, 
to educate and then to give her time to make the right decisions. Mm -hmm. And right. for some women, particularly young women, who are so anxious, it may be that bilateral mastectomies make perfect sense and will give her that peace of mind. For other women, once you educate them about the fact that survival is not going to change by removal of the opposite breast. But you heard what your mm -hmm. colleague said mm -hmm. about the fact that there's a quality of life issue. Mm -hmm. But survival, life and ahead. death, got is it. not going to change. So for some women, once they get their hands around that concept, mm -hmm. then they're much more comfortable in saying, I'm going to watch the Is breath. it fair to say that a part, one of the things that's changed, well, by the way, log on to our website as part of our new Healthy You initiative and get uh, information about this and other parts of the series. I'm curious. Is one of the things that has changed that there are more options, more alternatives, Absolutely. and more yeah. ways to go here? I mean, that's Absolutely. what I'm hearing. Even, I'll come even, back to you, even with the breast conserving surgery, now we're doing oncoplastic surgery, where right. in addition to removing the cancer, you're also doing plastic surgery on the breast to fix the defects, so that women with larger breasts are able to have lumpectomies and get you know matching surgery on the other side. So right. there, there are lots of options available to women to help them uh, with their choice. And those women who opt for mastectomy, we're now able to do nipple sparing mastectomies. Uh, but I'm not just talking about the mastectomy issue. I'm saying there are more options in terms of treatment. There are new drugs that are out there. there there's, are new there's the radiation. Different is types of is radiation. radiation different? Absolutely. Is chemotherapy different? Yes. Okay, it's all different than it was. Just go, oh, if I, I hate to go back to the 23 years, but just ago. that's an interesting point because mm -hmm. that's not a hypothetical. That was real for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was. And so, like, you know so what the differences real. are. And there were limited choices. Very, yeah. very limited choices. Mm -hmm. Very limited. Hey, let me ask you this because in preparing for, for this program, you had the. Every time, and I no disrespect to our producers, but the same question is there all the time about the big C. You know, they always put in there the big C. You know, is it is it perceived to be such a big C that it's a you know, cancer, that it's a, a death sentence? Well, here's the funny thing that I think about it. In many ways, as we're talking about this, has breast cancer, in the vast majority of cases, become more of a chronic Absolutely. illness? Uh -huh. Yeah. Is that a fair assessment? A very fair assessment, I, would, I think. Yeah. Even in advanced disease. So we're talking about early stage breast cancer, but then there are the women who recur, who relapse, who sure. have disease in their lungs or liver or bone. And even for those women, it, they used to be told you're going to die of breast cancer. Now we tell them, you have a chronic disease. It's how we manage that disease, how we mm -hmm. utilize all the drugs right. available. For some, it may be hormonal drugs for years. For some, it may be chemotherapy right away. But it, it is a disease that we've come a long way in terms of management. So the outcome for women is very different. And by the way, let's be clear about the stage, the different stages. Is one through five? One through four. One through four. One, oh, sorry, one through four in terms of mm -hmm. stages. Mm -hmm. And stage one is the? Small tumor negative lymph nodes. And four is? Disease okay, so outside of the breast, mm -hmm. lungs, lungs, liver, bone, bone liver, other, metastatic. other sites, metastatic. Okay. Let me ask you this in terms of um, this concept of personalized medicine that gets talked about a lot. We've done some programming on it in some of our other healthcare series. That the genetic testing part of this equation, what about for women who do not have breast cancer as far as they know it? But That's a different genetic but, but, testing. But let me just say this, that because there's a family mm -hmm. history, history mm -hmm. And that there's a well, give me the help on the gene. It's so the, for the women who the BRCA, the BRCA, which stands for B R A B R C A B R C A. What does it stand for? Breast cancer one and breast, breast cancer, cancer two. two. Okay, someone says, doctor, hey, listen, I'm predisposed. I'm going to good act before, and mm -hmm. they have a mastectomy. Is that happening? That's very. Okay, that's very rare. Very rare. Okay, what are most <laughs> women doing with that information? Okay, women who have a genetic uh, test and they test positive, we counsel them as to what they should do, which should be considered bilateral mastectomies and they should have bilateral oophorectomies because they're at risk for ovarian cancer okay. as, well, as well. Some women choose not to, so they get into a sort of surveillance mode where they have MRIs and they have ultrasounds and exams and et cetera. Um, the average person with a family history of breast cancer, mother had breast cancer or grandmother had breast cancer, we counsel them to you know, be very careful in terms of your surveillance, make sure you don't miss your mammograms, have a clinical examination, et cetera. Uh, very few, few women will opt to just do bilateral mastectomies without anything um, precipitating that, right. having a biopsy showing some precancerous condition, et cetera. So the average woman is, is not too anxious to part with her breasts. About, 
About 30% of women actually choose, who are mutation positive, mm -hmm. choose to have bilateral mastectomies. And I 30%. think it's about 30. And it's striking because it's a very much affected by the family history and what's happened in that family. So I'm currently dealing with a family where a young woman was diagnosed at 33. All of her cousins are coming in for testing and all of them have already decided that if they're positive, they're, this is what they will do. So who was diagnosed, at right. what, age, what age, and yeah. what their outcome was, of, very much affects. Yeah, but, but let me be clear on something. That's for women who are not diagnosed with breast cancer. For women who are, in fact, diagnosed with breast cancer, I want to be clear, it doesn't mean that surgery is a must. Are, uh, it, yes, in the majority of cases, surgery is the first thing that we do. Is the first thing. Mm -hmm. In some cases with a, a locally advanced cancer, patients may have what we call neoadjuvant chemotherapy, where they have the chemotherapy or even the hormone therapy up front okay. to shrink the tumor, making surgery easier. Got it. I want to come back to you and ask you a question. Um, in terms of breast health, one of the things that's always interesting to me is because I happen to know, you know Deb's family and We've talked about our kids a lot, and, mm -hmm. and your daughter, uh, Lindsay, who is how old now? 26. Stop. Um, I have two daughters. Do you have two daughters? How old? 28 and 21. Okay, here's the question mm -hmm. <clears throat> in terms of breast health and the way we communicate and talk about it. Lindsay's been involved in this from the beginning because you started the foundation and, and the whole bit. Exactly. Right? She was part of it. How do you talk to your daughters? Well. Right off the bat, um, when I got the information, you know, the, the positive cell thing, I just told them. Um, and but I told them the way I told them was the way I felt, and I, I kind of felt relieved <laughs> because it was like I got positive cells, and that's all I had. In terms of what you decided to do. Yes, and they, you know, because I am proactive and I take right. care of my body. Um, I found something that's going to be curable. Okay, but in terms of, here's what I'm trying to get at. I'm sorry I didn't ask the question clearly. In terms of what you've said to them about what they need to do for oh. themselves, in terms of, you know, the self-exam process, um, in terms of mammography. Well, Alexis already, I spoke to Dr. Mack about it, and she had a, um, she had, what, she had what, an MRI at 25, a breast MRI at 25, to get like a baseline for her. We got her a baseline, okay. and now she, you know, she goes to the gynecologist. Okay, and she but about, uh, the, I'm sorry for interrupting. Go to the mammography issue. Is to clear this up because one of the things, one of the reasons we got into public television was to try to clear up some confusion out there on uh, the estrogen issue. Is you know, there's some confusion, but go back to the mammography issue. There's lots of confusing information, seemingly conflicting information about mammography and their value, doctor. There is, and most of that confusion really revolves around the general population of normal risk women. When do you begin? Do you begin at 40? Many of us believe you should begin at 40, although begin some what? begin annual mammography annual, I want to at be clear. age 40 annual. for the woman at average risk in the U.S. population. Got it. The recommendations, though, are very different if you come from a family history of breast cancer. Okay, so, Deb's, so in Deb's family, you started... Lindsay's already been screened now for three years. And she's 26. I was diagnosed at 33, and it was mm -hmm. recommended that 10 years. 10 years younger than I was is when Lindsay should begin so screening. They, should, that so makes she, sense, doctor? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. The recommendations the recommendation. are to begin about 10 years younger than the youngest woman in the okay. family. Wow. And in the women that are mutation positive or in the women that are mutation negative but have a very strong family history, to add MRI in addition to mammography. So where's, where's the opposition and the negativity around mammographies coming from? Well, I think, <clears throat> again, one of the, there are always studies being published. And when, when a study is published saying that we, uh, we find that there is no increase in survival in those women who had screening mammograms starting at age 40, then you, everybody jumps on the bandwagon and says, well, maybe we ought not to do this. One other thing I would add is that we often recommend to women to have their baseline screening mammogram at age 35. And the reason for that is we are seeing breast cancer more and more in younger women. So I think waiting until 40 for that baseline may not be... You think it's five years too late? I think it's five years too late for your baseline. For your in baseline. terms of your actual annual screening, 
certainly 40 is. But 35 for the baseline. I would recommend. <clears throat> and Deb, with the mm -hmm. foundation, I mean, you guys, uh, more, we've talked about this, more and more younger women getting involved, greater concern. What do you, what, what's the Coleman Foundation telling them? You know, I, the, the, here's the thing. One in seven women in their lifetime in the state of New Jersey will be diagnosed with breast cancer. I think there's a fear factor. There's always been a fear factor for women overall that they could get breast cancer. So if for nothing else, mammography is our gold standard within this disease. So if it helps someone feel that they're being proactive with their health and but there's so many other pieces to this, just your general health and well-being and being a diligent person and taking care of all the aspects of your life. But I think it's a fear factor with women. Still? I, oh, I do. So that hasn't I do. changed. I, don't, I It really, I mean, what's changed is they know that the chances of survival become greater right. every single day. But there is still a fear factor. I, 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 when that diagnosis is told to you, the, uh, that hasn't changed. Uh, in spite I, of the information, no, in spite of the cancer. research, in spite of the I outcomes. I, think it's the word cancer. Cancer. I, I, I know, but, but <clears throat> I, I don't want to. Listen, we've, we've done many programs You're dealing with me. oncology, and there are diff obviously different types of cancer. But as cancers go, is, it, is, this, too, is this too rational that I'm saying that, that the survival rates? the outcomes are so much better when it comes to breast cancer that, eh, I'm not saying people say no big deal, but it, it's not as dramatic as the reaction in other patients well, getting a different diagnosis. I think about most patients cancer. just hearing the word cancer, whether well, it's... Exactly. I'm sorry for interrupting, Dr. For you, do you remember your first reaction? Um, yeah, I had like a little mini panic attack when she said on the phone <clears> that uh, I had positive cells. It was like whoosh. <sighs> And I'm, <laughs> I'm the kind of person that doesn't like to alarm everyone in my family. <laughs> so I always like get a positive outlook, and I, you know, become very strong at that point. You know, I became strong for everybody. That's how I've always. I, that's my thing. And, and the other thing you've done in terms of being positive, and you've talked about, you told our producers this. You're very caught up, not caught up. I mean, in a positive way, very focused on exercise. Yeah. And diet, and taking care of yourself. Right. And Deb, I know that's the same thing for you as well. How much do you believe that plays a role? in your health? Uh, I can't say for sure that, what yeah, you definitely, you know, and like, it's not like I'm an exercise addict. I mean, I'm this size because this is the size I've always been, you know, it's, I'm, not, I'm never on a diet. But, Stop bragging in front of everybody. But I, <laughs> but I try to, you know, I cook, so I like to eat like, you know, fresh vegetables and, you know, I, I'm con in control of what we consume. But is that, is that in any way directly correlated to the fact that you're a six year breast cancer survivor. Is the nutrition, the food in your house... Well, there's the starting to be increasing numbers of be. studies that are suggesting exactly that. And this us, year at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Meetings in December, there were at least five or six studies where they looked at women who had gotten chemotherapy for breast cancer or hormone therapy mm -hmm. for breast cancer, and they looked at obesity as mm -hmm. predictors of recurrence, and those women that were obese, and by obese we're talking about BMI greater than 30 or body such, mass index, body right. mass index greater than 30, and they had a significantly worse outcome. So I think the message we need to give to women is that exercise and lifestyle make a Not difference in developing <laughs> disease, but also that lifestyle and diet, obesity, et cetera, make a difference in outcome once you have the disease. So we need to educate women about that as a preventive process. You, you agree, doctor? Absolutely. You know, and patients always ask, you know, what do, what do I eat? Is there a special breast cancer diet? And I say to them, you know what, eat for your heart. Because eat if, for your heart. If you think about the things that they're recommended that you do for your heart, it goes throughout your, your, your entire sort right, of it helps everything. medical like a Medita issues. Like a Mediterranean diet. A Mediterranean diet. What you very carefully watch what you put in your mouth. The high fats, all of those things contribute to disease recurrences and people getting uh, cancer. So more fish and less red meat. Absolutely. Vegetables. Veg fresh fruits. Fr Come on, keep going. Fruits, vegetables, the oils that you use, the, mm -hmm. the extra virgin extra olive virgin oil, oil, canola, can, as opposed to the corn oils and the vegetable oils. Mm -hmm. 
the butters. I mean, I, I think there was something last week that said butter is good for you. Yeah, now, Don't yeah. listen to these things. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, by the way, on that note, I promise you, we're going to put the Mediterranean diet and other healthy uh, nutritional and pieces of information, exercise, okay. everything uh, in our uh, website. And I want to thank all of you for doing a tremendous public service. Thank Great you. job. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 20 years of broadcast excellence, and 13 for WNET, in cooperation with NJN Public Television and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Englewood Hospital and Medical Center and by Qualcare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents. Promotional support provided by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey, and The Star Ledger and NJ.com, Everything Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. This is One on One. I'm a poor boy, Join me as we get up close and personal with some of today's most compelling personalities. This is one you can't afford to miss. Saturdays at 10 a.m. on 13, Mondays at 7 a.m. and 1 p.m. on WLIW World, and Thursdays at 11.30 p.m. on WLIW 21.